And turn to John chapter 20, verse 31. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Bless this word now, Lord, anoint it as it goes forth. Your word is not the word of a man. It's the word of God. Thy name I pray. Amen. When I first got saved, I was around a lot of good people, no question about it, a lot of good preaching, but uh, I was not around a lot of what you might call real deep study, mostly shallow stuff, and most of what you hear today is shallow nitpicking or shallow cherry picking and that's about what people get and they think they're studying the Bible and they're not it took me years to learn the things that I've learned from studying the Bible here and there I'll find somebody when I'm reading that seems to be agreeing with most of what I say and then most of them don't most of them make no difference between the so called synoptic gospels and the gospel of John they make no difference they make no difference in the sermon on the mount and the purpose of the Gospel of John. They make no difference. They make no difference, and they get into a mess. They get into a big mess. For example, there's a lot of Christians that are passive. I respect that. You will not pick up arms. I respect that. But you should respect the fact that I would pick up an arm. And if you'll take Luke chapter 22, verse 36 home and pray over it, And you say, well, the Lord said if he smites you on one cheek, turn the other. Yes, he did. But you've got to understand, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, that's where you get in trouble. And we never had any division like that when I first got saved. There's no dividing of the Bible. Just jumped around here and there and quote this scripture, quote this looks good, quote it and this and that and this and that. You have to understand that the Bible, especially the New Testament, because it moves so much quicker, that you can see quickly before your eyes if you study it how it changes from one thing to another the last chapter the the book of Acts I want to read something to you verse 28 be it known therefore to you the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles let's stop for just a moment I thought Cornelius was a Gentile and he was saved long before this didn't you of course he was it is not saying that now Gentiles can be saved that's not what it said It said now the purpose and movement of the gospel is toward the Gentile and no longer the Jew. Why did it say that? Because God had blinded the Jews, Romans chapter number 11, and he's turned to the Gentiles and he's building his church. He's not building his kingdom. Right now on this earth he is not building his kingdom. As I preached the other day, I said, I quoted the Lord Jesus, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, note carefully, then would my servants fight. That's not, that's not passive. That's active, fighting. Of course, it opens up another question. I ask myself a number of times, why is that necessary? There's a reason for him having that confrontation in the Valley of Megiddo, the, Valley of Ar- the Battle of Armageddon. There's a reason for it. The fact is, there's a reason for everything, the Bible, a reason. So why was the Gospel of John written? It's a simple thing, folks. Salvation, there are people out there tonight, they mean well. Believe me, they mean well. And they're working as hard as they can work to try to work their way into heaven. They're sincere as they can be. But they feel like that there has to be something they do. They have to take part in it to show, how, show God their faith, to show God uh, their truth, uh, you know, how that they're sincere in what they do. But you're not saved because you're sincere. You're not saved because you put your best effort into it or you you, you even memorize the Bible, memorize all of your catechisms. That doesn't save you. 
The apostle, the apostle John said in the book of John, 1 John 5, he said, He that hath the Son hath life. Well, how do you get the Son then? The Gospel of John, written by the same apostle, makes it very clear. These things are written that you might work, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by working you might have life through His name. Did I mess that up? But that's a lot of preaching you hear today. It's as simple as this. These things are written that you might believe. Anybody can believe. You don't have to have any money. You don't have to have any ability. Just believe. Believe God's word and take God at his word, which means that you are moving into the character of God who cannot lie. That's what's happening. You're believing on the one who sent his son and you're believing the son who came. You're receiving him. In the book of Matthew, which is, which is a Jewish kingdom book, because that's where the, the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon of the Gospel of the Kingdom of Heaven is all spread out for people. The book of Matthew. And you have start with the genealogy of the Jewish kings. And it's all there for you. But the Gospel of John is so different. So different. I remember I hadn't been saved long and we got, got around some Armenians. And they were showing you, well, now look, you have your salvation. You can be saved today, but you can be lost tomorrow. And a lot of them were good people. I don't doubt that. A lot of them were good people. But I never could get any one of them to ever give me that place where you lose it Amen. tomorrow. Amen. That's not mocking them. That's making them look at what they say they believe. Because we're coming down to the issue of the new birth, John chapter number 3. These things are written that you might believe. Now look at this. And believing you might have life through his name. This life that it's talking about is eternal life. Matthew, Mark, Luke come nowhere near the gospel of John when it talks about eternal life, eternal life, eternal life, everlasting life, everlasting life. That is the theme that runs all the way through the gospel of John. It is the last book of the Gospels written. It may have been written after uh, the Apocalypse, but I think it's probably Revelation was written le the last one. But they were both written by the same man. John the Apostle, he wrote Revelation. John the Apostle wrote the, uh, the Gospel of John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. So he was prolific outside of the Apostle Paul in writing Scripture. Now what does it mean to believe? How many of you believe God is God? Believe there's a God. You believe that Jesus Christ is his son. Okay. Well, before I got saved, I believed in a man upstairs, a supreme being. Did you believe in a supreme being, man upstairs? I used to talk about that all the time. We'd get around on the ship. When I was over there in the Mediterranean, we'd be playing poker. And uh, this is long before I got saved. And when you're on a ship out in the middle of the, Atlantic, uh, the Mediterranean. You, you can't go, uh, you know where to go. <laughs> and we'd sit around and we'd talk about God and we'd talk about Christ and we'd talk about church and we'd talk about the Bible and we'd tell each other what all we believed. And I told them, I said, well, I believe in a supreme being. Well, I do too. And I believe in the man upstairs. Well, I do too. And, uh, but I told you about the one at the table who said, I don't. I'll never forget him. That was a long time ago. He said, I don't. They said, how come? He said, if there's a God, he wouldn't have let my little daughter die the way she did. Little girl died. No mercy, shown no mercy, no nothing. I don't know. That was a long time ago. I don't know if he ever came to saving faith in Christ. I have no idea. But that was over 50 years ago on the ship. The USS Sandoval over there in the Mediterranean. All that time, I didn't know him. But when I bowed my head in that living room, 1973, and I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and into my soul and save me. I raised my head back up and I was a completely different person and I knew it. And nobody could have told me what to expect when that happened. Somebody had moved inside of me and I had a desire for the absolutely opposite of what I had been. I desired the Bible, I desired God, I desired prayer, I desired spiritual things. Where'd that come from? I wanted to go to church every time the doors were open. I was sitting right there in the middle, and a man sitting in front of me, 
he was, he was an amener. Amen, amen. I sat there and listened to him long enough. I said, amen. <laughs> You're not going to be the only one in here that says amen. So I said, amen. Now, by the way, that's a Hebrew word, you know. Now, it's amen. It's amen, they say it in Hebrew. Amen. Yes, I agree. I agree. That's what you're saying when you say amen. So these things are written that you might believe. He didn't say these things are written that you might build a kingdom. He didn't say these things are written that you may, that you may do anything else as it relates to religion. Just a simple statement. He said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. You may know that you have eternal life. Now notice carefully. You may know that you have eternal life. That's one of the great points of the Bible. You've got it now. Huh. It's not something you earn. It is a present possession. Truth of the matter is, though, I hope he possesses me more than I possess him. <laughs> Amen. Because I'm fallible. The Bible said in John 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Life eternal. I was thinking the other day, my mind drifted off into eternity. And I was sitting there thinking about eternity. It doesn't make any difference how long anybody has ever lived, how long the angels have been here. That's nothing compared to what's in front of us. There's no end to it everlasting to everlasting, eternal. You can't grasp it. You can't do it. You can't grasp it. You think you can, but you can't. It's just, a, you, you just cannot, a human being cannot take in what that means forever. That's, that's mind boggling. John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. This is eternal life. Look at what he gives. Light. When you're born again, God gives you a unique ability to ferret out, get around the hucksters and the religious charlatans and get to something, get to the truth. Now, I can understand how people can hold different views about things in the New Testament. I certainly can because, if first of all, if you don't put it in there dispensationally, you can get in trouble. Not only that, the way you interpret it. People interpret the Scripture in a different manner. Sure they do. I respect that. I respect that. The crowd I came from doesn't respect anything. It's just their way or the highway. And uh, that's not what I believe at all. John 5, 39, he said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Searching the scriptures meant searching the Tanakh, searching Genesis through Malachi. In the Jewish order, it's Genesis through 2 Chronicles. Search the scriptures, he said. The scripture, the word of God, they held in high esteem. And he said, you think you have eternal life from reading the scripture. So therefore, the Jewish Old Testament, if interpreted correctly, taught the Jews they had eternal life. That's what the Lord said. John 5, 40 said, and you will not come to me that you might have life John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and this is one of my favorite scriptures. I memorized this. I hadn't been saved any time. I memorized it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, pass from death into life. How many of you remember in the garden when they sinned, God put a cherubim with a flaming sword to keep the way to what tree was it? Exactly. And he said, lest they eat of this tree and live forever. In other words, they were in a fallen state, fallen state, and had they eaten of that tree, they would have continued throughout eternity in that condition. And God was so gracious, he wouldn't let it happen. Now, when you get home, look at that text. And you'll find that that is a pause in the text. The sentence isn't finished. It's not finished. He just says it and puts it out there for you to think about. Where are you going to be 100,000 trillion years from now? And that's nothing. Eternity doesn't have any clocks. 
This is why God, the eternal, absolute one, there's no clocks to him forever and ever. How he has existed, don't let anybody ever tell you they know. They don't know. Why don't they know? Because they don't know the essence of a spirit being. I don't know that. Just like I told you before, time and again, there is no doctor walking the face of this earth that can tell you the essence of life. And the reason he cannot do that is because he doesn't know the essence of a spirit. And life is spirit. As the body without the spirit is dead, all right? Not the soul, the spirit. And when that spirit leaves that body, the body's dead. Didn't say the spirit was dead. Body's dead. Spirit is life. Therefore, God is going to give me of his spirit and seal me for me to have everlasting life. And it's the gift of God. John 6, 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. The sixth chapter of John is an awful controversial chapter too. Because it's from the sixth chapter of John that you get what's called the Eucharist. And the Eucharist has, has to do with uh, each time that uh, the Orthodox and the Catholics and so forth meet, they have this offering up of the body and the blood of Christ. And uh, they do it every time, they, and they take it too. They, they take the body, they take the blood. They think that by doing that, that it, uh, that, that it has become the body and blood of Christ that they have to take on a regular basis. They, it's called transubstantiation. They say, well, we know it not, it's not physically his blood, but it has become his blood spiritually, and we receive it. And so this is what they're doing. And they get it from John 6. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak to you, their spirit and their life. So he told them right here, you're not saved because you got a thing. You're not saved because you can touch anything. You're not saved because you can eat anything. He told them in John 6, he said, the words that I say unto you, he that hath my blood, he, hath, he that eateth, my, eateth my, my body, drinketh my blood, that is spiritual. And when you believe it, you've received it. Here's the problem. You don't know the essence of a spirit. Do you know the essence of the Holy Spirit? Well, of course not. But is he in the Godhead? Well, of course he is. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. John 6, 64. There are some of you that believe not. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. In John 12, 49, For I have not spoken of myself. The Father which sent me gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, he was the Father said unto me, so I speak. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ are salvation. But the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ is salvation. The mind of the Lord Jesus Christ is salvation. Wherever he walks and presents himself is salvation. Why? He is salvation personified. John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. Without him was anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into this world. How many's ever heard of a Quaker? Y'all heard of Quakers? Uh, William Penn, Pennsylvania, Quaker. They believed that every man had a spark of divinity in him. A spark of divinity. Where'd they get that from? They got it from John chapter number 1. He's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. But now that's their interpretation of that light. Are you following me? That's their interpretation of it. I don't necessarily believe it that way, but I do believe that in every, according to the scripture, every human being that is born on this planet, there's a light in his soul that holds him accountable to God. And he's got to do something with it. Now, uh, we get to uh, John 11, he said he shall never die. John 11, 25, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. And the life, I am the life. 
He says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. So what's he saying? He says, I'm giving unto them myself. That's what he's saying because he is eternal life. He is. He that hath the Son, he didn't say what he that hath what the Son says. 1 John 5, he said, he that hath the Son hath life. And I don't want to be confusing in here tonight, but the Lord Jesus Christ is the life of God that is given to man. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are believing on the Savior and the life that God has given you. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are exercising that light that God gives to every man and acknowledging that you're a sinner, that you need, that you need to be saved, and you repent. And all these are issues. You're not saved because you repent, but you repent because you have saving faith. You see what I'm saying? This crowd today running around telling people, well, you don't need to repent. That's works. No, it's not. If you tell somebody to repent and you're saved because you repent, that is works. But that's not what I preach. I never have preached it. What I preach is this. If you have saving faith, if you really believe what the Bible says about you, you will accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Repentance is not accepting Him. You accept Him by faith. But once you have accepted Him by faith, that light comes into your soul and all that garbage in there and bones and everything else that you got in there, it's going to start working on it, boy. And you're going to open up, and if you really got born again, it'll take you a month or two to do all the repenting you need to do. <laughs> I, did some, I did some powerful repenting after I, got, after I got saved. Lord was good to me. He'd come to me and show me a bunch of stuff in my life, and I repented of it. He didn't show it all to me at one time. He was gracious over a period of time. He allowed all this to come up. Now, yes, Lord, I remember that now. Well, I repent. And on you go. All right. What is repentance? Somebody said, well, it's simply a change of mind. No, it's more than that. You know what repentance, real repentance is? It's accepting God's statement about what a thing is. It's accepting it and doing what you know is the right thing to do but toward, toward Almighty God and say, Lord, no excuses. That's what I am. God, forgive me. And cleanse me. That's repentance. Not just changing your mind. Uh, in John chapter number 3 verse 3. He said except a man be born again. Now you have a religion out there. That taught that the Lord Jesus Christ was born again. And they taught that he was born again at his resurrection. Alright. So therefore they have changed the meaning of born again. They've changed this meaning. That's what they've done. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't need to be saved. He was never lost. He was perfect. The fact is, he's the only perfect one ever walked this earth, was the Son of God. But except a man be born literally of the Spirit of the living God. That's what he means. They could even said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time his mother's womb be born? John 1.13 says, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. See the spiritual element? You're born of God. All right? Remember when I preached the other day, he's the author of eternal salvation? Remember that one? Okay? In eternity past, he was the Savior. He's the Lamb of God chosen before the foundation of the world. Okay, now that's foresight. That's God saying that I am going to save you. But he had never suffered the wrath of God and had gone through what a human being goes through on this earth. Therefore, when he became the author of eternal salvation, that salvation takes into consideration all of the human experience. That's what it does. It takes it in. I can't walk in your shoes and you can't walk in mine. But God's already walked in yours. He's already walked in them. See what I mean? Everybody doesn't uh, get the same, what do you call it? I don't know. Same uh, treatment. Some folks seem like they just skate through life and, and you know, everything goes hunky-dory. <laughs> it hadn't been that way with me. And it's not that way with most people. So I'll leave it to God. I'll leave your life and what happens to you in the hands of God. Aren't you glad God didn't call on you to micromanage the lives of people? Amen. Amen. I can't even run my own life, much less somebody else's. 
Good night. John 12, verse 5. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world, cosmos, shall keep it into life eternal. When he says world here, he's talking about the feeling, the spirit, what pulls men and women together, what they live for, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He talks about in 1 John. That is the world. See what I mean? And this Bible says that his world he will keep unto life eternal. John 3.16. You all heard this one before, haven't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ Jesus the Lord is begotten in a manner that none of us are. He's the only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, simply believe in him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. I want the life of God, folks. I'll just tell you the truth tonight. Now, I mean, cut to the chase. I, I, don't, I, have, I have no desire to live forever the way I've lived in this world. If this is the only life that you'll ever know and you'll have to live forever with a life like this, would you want to do that? Nobody in their right mind would. This is why the apostle said, in this life, if we have Christ, in this life only, if we have Christ, we are of all men most miserable. No, the life I get is the life of God. He'll give me his life. Thanks be unto God. He won't make me God, <laughs> but he'll give me his life. And that's the gift of God. And so what's eternity going to be like, preacher? I have no idea, but I know God's going to be there. And that's good enough for me. Amen. The Bible said in John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Sealed. If you weren't sealed, you better believe Satan would come after you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you're sealed to the day of redemption, a sealing means that you're closed in. A sealing means that you're marked. A sealing means that you're preserved. There's a lot of elements involved in sealing, and he has sealed you by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you're born again tonight, folks, you'll always be born again. You'll never, un, you'll never be anything but that. I'm a son of God by the new birth. I'll always be a son of God by the new birth. Nothing can change that. But then he goes a step further, and he seals me. That, why did he do that? Because he gave me everlasting life. Yeah, I like this. John 10, 28. I read this to my Arminian friends when I found out it was in the Bible. <laughs> I said, I was reading one down, I thought, good night. That's something else. John 10, 28, here's what it says. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Do you believe what it says? Amen. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 29, my father which he gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Yeah, but my Armin and friends said, well, that's okay, but you can pluck yourself out of his hand. That's what they said. I'll never forget that. I don't have the greatest memory, but I remember that. I said to myself, ah, oh, soul, the depths people will go to, <coughs> the links they'll go to when you're dealing with something. Now, let's read it. I give unto them eternal life. You have life. And they shall never perish. There's no condition to that. That's, that's unconditional. See? Neither, now look at this, shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Sealed. Can't pluck you out of his hand. My Father which gave them me, no man comes to me except the Father which has sent me, draw them. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. You may have something happen in your life that blows your foundation away. You'll get so hard, so cold, so mad at God. I've seen it happen time and again. It's liable to happen to me. I hope it never does. But I won't put any trust in my flesh. My faith's in God tonight. But you could have something happen to you that will literally destroy you, and you could turn around and become a blasphemer. And, you could, and you, could, you, could, you could spend the rest of your life blaspheming, cursing, 
uh, cursing God for what's happened to you. And people can get, you get hurt, folks. People get hurt. I understand that. And it takes a time to heal. There's some healing time there. And if you've got anybody that's got any grace about them, a real gracious Christian, they're going to be there to help you heal. Unlike what Pam said tonight about these devils out here heaping sorrow upon sorrow, God help them. They need to get right with God. Look who they are. But when people go through something like that, you bear their burdens, and all they need to know, really, this, this, is, this is the bottom line, folks. You don't really have to have the right words to comfort somebody. So what do you need, preacher? They just need to know you care. That's all. That'll, that'll, that'll speak into their soul. You care. That's all. Because uh, words don't really comfort that much if they're coming from you. But if they know you care, that'll be the greatest comfort you can give them. That's why I bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, have mercy. I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes I'll get a hold of something and I'll pray and I'll pray and I'll pray because I know they need grace from God. I hope you do. I hope with all your heart. Don't turn on each other. You see somebody going through some hard thing, don't, 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 don't t take a diet or fees or something like that. Pray for them. Because what they're going through today, you may be going through in a year from now. Pray for them. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Father, bless your word. Thank you for reaching down in hell. <laughs> Thank you for reaching down in hell, Lord. There you found me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you reached into hell and you call my name. Thank you. There may be somebody out there. I get their emails all the time, Lord. You know that. You know every email I get, every word I read, you know that. And I get it from people who are broken. I just read one. You know that one from this lady yesterday. Broken. Broken. Thinking about committing suicide. Life is torn apart. Doesn't know where to do, turn. Wouldn't know what to do. I pray for her tonight. I pray for her right now. I pray for her. Let the sweet Holy Ghost move in her soul and help her. I pray for these families lost their little babies, their little children, their little daughters. 21-year-old daughters, I pray for them. I pray for them, Father. I pray in thy name. And I pray that the antagonist that you deal with them I pray for them I pray you deal with them I pray for them I pray now in Jesus name watch over us keep us safe and bring us back again in thy holy name I pray tonight amen amen God bless you appreciate you